Hello and welcome to this video. And on this video, I'm gonna ask the question, is this prog? Is this prog? I can hear you all shouting at home. Is this prog? Right, I am really throwing oil on the fire because it gets me quite annoyed this does this video is going to be called is this prog <laughs> um, I get into this discussion over and over again online and I try to not and I get into it and why do I get into it and the question is of course is this prog that's not prog and then I start throwing definitions of what prog is and it seems to come down to that prog is anything that sounds like a selection of completely different sounding bands from the 70s. So if you sound like Pink Floyd, or you sound like Genesis, or you sound like ELP, three bands that don't sound anything like each other, but if you sound like those bands, you're prog, and that's what prog is. Um, to me, that's just the limitations of the listener, okay? Um, and I'm pretty sure that there's so many other bands that have come out that if they'd have been pushed at that time in the early 70s as being progressive rock, those people would be saying, yes, they're progressive rock too. So on this video, I want to try and arrive at a definition of what I think prog is. I'm going to try and to tie together this idea that there's progressive rock, which is music that progresses, and then there's the prog rock genre, and they're two separate things. Um, which I think is a stupid thing to do because that's how you kill a genre. Genres die when they don't move forward. The one genre that should be moving forward is progressive rock because it's supposed to progress. Oh no, but that's not what progressive is nowadays. Prog, prog's the name of a genre, you know, if you're in seven, eight and you've got like loads of Moog synthesizers and Mellotrons and you've got songs about wizards, and, you know, then that is prog. But I can actually point to bands that do that and then they go, oh, yeah, but that isn't prog. Right, so there's a real issue for me. Why does this matter? Because I think if prog, like many other genres, was more open to, to artists and styles, if they actually opened their arms and welcomed in these artists that either it are full on prog or have progressive rock tendencies, what would happen is that people in the mainstream would see that this music is, is linked, that things are linked together. I think that the success of Kate Bush, uh, the fact that she's at number one all over the world uh, with the track Running Up That Hill, which is on an album called Hounds of Love, which has a full sidelong epic conceptualised around the idea of, you know, somebody facing death with uh, allusions to supernatural activity, witches and all that, with, with like insane uses of technology on time signatures, virtuosity, that's a prog epic. The ninth wave is a prog epic. And so people are buying that and, they'll, and, and people who have ears, people who have got an open mind will, will now be buying the Hounds of Love or, or listening to it on Spotify and get to that track. And some people will be going, oh my God, I love this. What is this music? I've never heard it before. What is it? And the progressive rock will, world will be going, well, it's not progressive rock. So don't come over here listing and linking that to this because there's no influence there whatsoever. You know, and that just seems stupid to me. It's out and out stupid. Right? So let's just have a blast through what is prog and what isn't prog. I've just pulled out a few albums and I'm not going to be pulling in like Public Enemy albums or The Streets albums or Kendrick Lamar and albums that and arguing that they're progressive rock. But I could be. I'm going to play it pretty safe, I think, and I think some of these albums are undeniably progressive rock. I think this album is an early progressive rock album. Black Sabbath, Paranoid. This was made in 1970. This came out when progressive rock was just forming. Yes, hadn't become a progressive rock punk band at this point. ELP had just brought out their first album. Um, the genre is forming. People didn't know quite know how to do it. They didn't know how to extend... Um, tunes make them longer to break away from love song pop lyrics these are all the things that make prog to to be able to change tempo within a in a track but on this album right on the tracks war pigs electric funeral hand of doom 
I would say that those are progressive rock tracks. And Planet Caravan, which is almost like, I would describe that as trip hop. <laughs> Right? Planet Caravan, that's an astonishing track. If that's not a progressive rock track. So I'm not saying this whole album, I'm not saying Paranoid's progressive rock. Paranoid's, of course, is just a communication breakdown ripoff. That's not what makes this album important. What makes this album important is the breakthrough they make, not only in creating heavy metal, but, but helping provide the blueprint for progressive rock. And what do they do? It's the ability to create tunes that go somewhere that are outside the normal pop song format to be able to change tempo and change time. Black Sabbath, I think, really pioneered something on this album where they did that. Um, let's just start blasting through some of these albums I've pulled out. Is this progressive rock? Because this is a great big pop album in 1978 in the UK. Is that progressive rock? Of course it's progressive rock. This album does everything that you're supposed to do with progressive rock. And I'm sure a lot of the the the, the prog gatekeepers are quite happy to call this one progressive rock but this has got disco influences on it's got a whole bunch of other stuff on there as well so why is this one progressive rock right and this album isn't now i'm sure a lot of the progressive rock fans there are going well i don't even know what that album is this is again is an album a triple album made by carla blay in 1970 it's a conceptual album with which is almost like a jazz classical rock opera this is one of the most progressive rock albums ever made in 1970 before um yes had made close to the edge you know carla blay had made this triple album right this goes over three sides it features musicians like jack bruce john mcgoughlin it pe features paul motion from uh bill evans band it's got like um charlie hayden on it I think um, a hot, I think we've even got Linda Ronstadt on here or somebody like that. I may have made that up. I think I've made that up. But this, and it features an orchestra on there, that is a progressive rock album. This is a progressive rock album. It's more of a progressive rock album than Soft Machine's 30s, which is a jazz album. It's a jazz with classical influences like Frank Zappa. But this is a prog album, okay? Um, if we go to the jazz, jazz fusion genre we get albums like this romantic warrior look at the cover let's leave the titles of the tracks medieval overture sorceress the majestic dance magician the jewel of the gesture and the tyrant that's a prog album that is a prog album all right um this lenny white album is a prog album on side two there's a track that features jerry goodman jan hammer there's pat gleason on emu synthesizer we've got mirsal vitos We've got Mike Gibbs who is orchestrating the orchestras on here and there's a track called The Enchanted Pool Suite which is broken down into three parts, Prelude and then part one and then part two. This is a progressive rock album. These, these are progressive, to me, these are progressive rock albums. To, this is the greatest album ever made. You know, anyone who's watched my channel will know I've said this over and over again. This is the greatest album ever made. It's a jazz fusion album. It's also one of the it's one of the greatest progressive rock albums ever made. These fusion albums are all progressive rock albums, right? They, f they feature rock music mixed with classical music. They feature instrumental virtuosity, long form composition, right? They break away from pop song formats. You know, they um, use technology, they use synthesis. This is what makes prog prog. This is what unifies all the bands that you think are prog, right? This is a progressive rock album. Right, Led Zeppelin, House of the Holy, this is a progressive rock album, without a doubt. You know, I don't think all the, all the um, Zeppelin albums are progressive rock albums. I think um, some of them have progressive rock influences. But, but back here in 1972, this is a full-on progressive rock album that does everything that Yes and Genesis do. Um, a, a, a really wide range of styles, which goes from folk music through to rock music, through to reggae, through to funk. They use long form compositions. Um, they use um, non pop song structures. Um, they're, they're writing songs that aren't about love. Some of this is about love, but some of it isn't. Some of it's, uh, is, 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 you know, if you think about a tune like No Quarter, it's lyrically pulling from the very thing that prog is, which is sort of Tolkien s sword and sorcery imagery. This is, this is a prog album. I mean, look at this here. This is prog imagery. 
you know, some people will be going, oh, well, that's a prog album. That's a prog album. I accept that, Andy. That's a prog album. But if that's a, a prog album, what if you made a double al conceptual album full of instrumentals about the secret life of plants, as Stevie Wonder did on this album, right? Which features the opening track as an instrumental, which is called Earth's Creation, which then goes into a track called The First Garden, right? With, with um, Stevie Wonder playing all the instruments, a bit like um, Mike Oldfield on Tubular Bells. And then we have this Voyage to India. These are all instrumental tracks. You know, this features orchestras, it features... Um, uh, the the uh, the use of synthesis technology, but also classical forms. This to me is a progressive rock album. You know, Stevie Wonder made this in when was it? It's about seventy seven, isn't it? Is it or seventy eight? I can't quite remember. Seventy five. It's a, it's mid seventies. You know, why why has he moved from doing tracks like Footprints, you know, and um, all that stuff that he did, you know, Superstition. To him, by the mid 70s, he's making a conceptual album about plants. I'll tell you why, because he was listening to progressive rock bands like everybody else. Um, right, do you want to see a progressive rock album now? A full on progressive rock album? A triple album, which has got a story that runs over all six sides, that features instrumental virtuosity, that, in, that, that features the integration of modern classical composition within a rock band with extended solos. Um, with the use of synthesis, use of technology. Of course, Frank Zappa, if I get it right way around. Joe's Garage, or as we would say in the UK, Joe's Garage. Um, this is a prog album. It's about as prog as you can get. You know, um, what about Pat Metheny? What about this one I held up at the start? Right, what about that? Do you know this album, Proggers? Right, this is one hour and eight minutes track, right? which is through composed, which conceptually hangs together compositionally from the first opening right to the end. You know, you know that most prog bands are stumbling, they're, they're, they're exploring the idea of classical composition. There's very few that were able to do that. Right, some could, I think Gentle Giant could, but Gentle Giant tended to keep their tunes to sh quite short forms. I think Keith Emerson was capable of, of it, and he did it with his piano concerto. Whether he did it successfully is another matter, but he did do it. But here we have rock beats, we have minimalism, avant-garde jazz, Latin American music, all pulled together in one through composed hour and ten minutes track. I can't think of another progressive rock artist that is able to successfully um, create such an artistically correct long form composition of this. I think this is perhaps the greatest long form composition on an album. An hour and eight minutes all the way through and it doesn't let up. And Pat Metheny does not fill that up with solos, right? This is a progressive rock album. This is, if you're a prog musician, go and check that out because that is like, sets the standard for long form progressive um, rock composition, right? And I'll return now, last of all, to this, because this is the outlier. I brought one outlier. I, I believe all the albums I've shown you today are progressive rock albums, okay? This one, I would say, is not progressive rock, but is massively influenced on progressive rock, and it's called The English Settlement by XTC. And I'm really chuffed to be able to put this on my channel. Um, I really wanted to pull out a post-punk new wave band that I believed is dripping with progressive rock influences. Um, if the progressive rock world, if the progressive rock fans, because I don't actually think anymore it's the um, music press. I think that's gone. Obviously in the mid-70s there was a turn against progressive rock amongst the music press that was seen as being overblown, pretentious uh, music made by, you know, people who had lost, lost touch with their rock and roll roots. Punk came out and set the record straight and then music was put back on track. I don't accept this at all as a, as a, um, a storyline. I think it's far more nuanced than that. I believe that punk came out of prog. I think um, those musicians that formed those punk bands were completely aware of the prog bands that they were re reacting against. And they reacted against certain aspects of prog, but not the whole thing, okay? 
what they didn't react against was certain things which I think define what prog is, all right? I think prog, there's a certain homemade experimental sort of, um, almost like the English eccentric in, inventor in his shed discovering the secrets of DNA. You know that sort of very British, innovative, creative, aspect that the English people have, you know, that they, they will be able to, you know, win the Second World War with a, a broom handle and a kitchen knife tied up against it. That's an aesthetic thing that I feel, especially in the early prog, and I feel it in, in punk, and I think it came into its own with the neo-prog bands, bands like Marillion, and the band I used to play for IQ, where they really were a cottage industry, like punk. Um, I think that English eccentric thing is in prog. But the other thing that's in prog is what I call the English aesthetic. Now the English aesthetic is a very specific type of aesthetic which almost is the opposite of what you think prog would be. It's whimsical, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's at once intellectual but it's also once very base as well. I hear the English aesthetic in Shakespeare, or I hear it in the Romantic Poets. I can, I can hear it if I was to read um, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, or Dracula, or any of those sort of gothic Victorian novels. Sherlock Holmes has the English aesthetic. Music Hall has the English aesthetic. Um, Will Hay, George Formby, these all have the English aesthetic. Um, the Goons. Um, Monty Python, okay, these all have a, and what is it about the English aesthetic? It, it, it is the, a, the ability to bring down authority um, by poking fun at authority, all right? So the British, and this goes back to, into British history, it goes back to that, that our having a, a monarchy, it goes back to um, the way we had a revolution and took our, our, our monarchy down and then put them back in. But we, we put our monarchy back in. We didn't put them back in with, with, with the powers that they had. They, they, they represented something, but they had no power. I think this is a very clever thing that the British culture has done. I think this is um, why British culture was able to create a sort of liberal ph ph philosophy, ph philosophy of tolerance, okay? All this is wound into the English aesthetic. I'm getting very intellectual here. How can I put this in simple terms? Think of a tune like The Laughing Policeman. The Laughing Policeman is funny and jolly. It's affectionate to our law um, keepers in this country. It at once celebrates them and also brings them down to a point where nobody could take them seriously, okay? I feel that that's in English music. I feel it's in punk. I feel it's in the Beatles. I feel it's in a lot of prog. I feel it's in Jethro Tull. I can hear it in ELP. I can hear it in King Crimson. There's an English aesthetic at work, right? And that English aesthetic is, is, is gently against authority. I know this sounds strange, but I think the early progressive rock bands were reacting against a pomposity that came from British middle class, mostly art students, trying to pretend they were American blues artists from the 30s, okay? Um, I think actually bands like Led Zeppelin, Fleetwood Mac and Pink Floyd, they dealt with it quite cleverly. They had to deal with that and they had to deal with that by winding in Englishness in. And as you start to wind in Englishness in, you start to create a rock music which is less derived on blues forms, but has that um, aspect to it. But you have to consider your own culture, so British bands would then consider the culture that came from their literature, that came from their history. And when you wind that in, it starts to create a form of music. That's what progressive rock is. Pro progressive rock, the homemadeness, and this sort of anarchistic um, innovation also means that you're gonna use technology. 
you're going to use, we're going back to that English eccentric in the shed, you know, building a little nuclear reactor out of his used pipes. Um, and he'll be smoking a pipe while he does it. I think that um, the use of technology is really important. So what we get is a form of music that is eccentric, homemade, which uses classical music forms, which uses literary forms, is not afraid of, 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 of using intellectual sources, but will bring down those intellectual sources with a sort of sense of humour, an almost surreal sense of humour. It will use technology. It will react against, fundamentally, the pop song structure of the day. This is popular music that reacts against popular music. That is precisely what punk was. It was precisely what prog was in the early days. It's almost like prog turned around to punk saying, you have forgotten what you're really about. Okay? And once that happened, um, progressive rock music musicians then drew themselves in. In the case of Peter Gabriel, in the case of um, uh, Genesis, of Yes, Asia, all these prog bands that emerge and become huge pop stars, right? There is still a big dose of progressive rock in those bands. And as I always say to people, I go, oh, I don't like the poppy genesis. Right, musically, what, what are they not doing? Because to my ears, they're still doing what they did before musically. They've just drawn it in. They're not just not doing 20 minute epics and singing about moonlit nights. Right, that's, that's the only difference. But if you're actually to musically what's going on, the weird time signatures there, the chords are there, the use of synthesis there, it's still there. Am I saying it's prog rock? No. But it's, it's in the lineage of prog rock. And if the progressive rock world does not want to open its arms up to the music that it's birthed, which is the totality of music after the 70s, right? All artists are influenced by progressive rock. If you're going to deny that and not point it out, you will cut yourself off. You will bring down the remit of what progressive rock is to something so narrow that cannot progress. And once music cannot progress, it dies. And this form will die with the continually aging audience that are still holding on to it. Many of you watching this channel. And that's a shame because this means it's fantastic. I have played this stuff to young people and they love it. So what do we need to do? We need to rethink what is prog and what isn't prog? We need to also open our arms up to stuff that isn't prog, but is definitely prog influence and celebrate it. We need to bring it all back together. You know, so if you're a heavy metal musician, it's very easy for you to point at Black Sabbath and say, I come from that. I know my music doesn't sound like that anymore and it's moved on so far, but there's my roots, Black Sabbath, right? We need other artists, we need uh, the, 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 the music press and the fans to say this as well. They need to say, yeah, I love XTC, I love XTC for the same reason I love Genesis, because it's the same thing. I can hear the, the, the connection between those two bands. That needs to be said. Anyway, the end of my video. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much.